The first reading is from Isaiah, the 64th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Here ends the first reading. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 24th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down to us. This was Isaiah's lament. This was Isaiah's prayer and plea that God would open up the heavens and come down. Isaiah was a prophet who voiced the, the struggle of his people that um, they had been going along for many, many years and they felt like they were sinning and transgressing against God and that in return God was hiding his face from them. But yet, at the same time, he trusted that God was always there with his people. And at the end of Isaiah's reading for today, he talks about God as an almighty potter, that we are the work of his hands, that he molds us and forms us to be his people, to walk in his ways. But the question of that day, and for our day as well, is what shape will this take? What will this look like? Will this look like shock and danger? Or will it look like a lowly manger? Enter now into the gospel for today, into Mark's gospel. It was a short reading for today that is uh, a different sort of literature. We're moving from a prophetic sort of voice from Isaiah into now an apocalyptic sort of language that we see in Mark's gospel. An apocalyptic literature rises out of uh, sort of a political environment where there's a lot of turmoil and crisis going on. And then if there's social upheaval, apocalyptic literature is usually present. And here, in this context, in Mark's gospel, it's 70 AD, just before and just as the Jewish revolt is happening, and the destruction of the temple is about to happen. And so as you can imagine, there is a lot of stress happening in the environment. And so we're dealing with two different kinds of literature here, the prophetic and then the apocalyptic. But this 
gospel we have today is sort of copy and pasted into where it is in Mark's gospel. It's between the false prophets and the fig trees in Mark. And it's nestled sort of in there to sort of awaken or shake up the people. Like, that's what Advent is. This is the beginning of a new church year. It's like, hey, folks, wake up. We have this God who is breaking through, and you better be ready, because he's going to come in a way that you're not expecting at all. And the way that was prophesied was with great power and dominion and glory. Advent begins sort of like an earthquake. I asked at the last service if anybody had been actually in an earthquake. Has anybody ever like, felt what that felt like? We had one at the last service. Dan, you've been in? Oh, wow, you've got quite a few of you who've actually felt what that feels like. It's kind of twisted, but I, I kind of want to be in one. I want to be in one that everybody's safe and fine, but I just want to feel what that feels like to where you're like, whoa, what's happening? That is the effect of Advent 1, this sort of cataclysmic big bang, big boom sort of experience where it's like, whoa, what is happening in the world right now? What's happening is that God is trying to break through into our world in a way that we least expect. This last summer, we were in Iceland, and it wasn't really on purpose that we were in Iceland, but it was great that we were in Iceland. We, we flew um, Icelandic air, and part of the gig is that you have a layover day in Iceland. I suppose just to boost tourism or whatever it might be, but we had a really great day in Iceland there, and we were driving around the countryside with this guy who was into uh, geothermal. He was a geothermal engineer there in Iceland. As you look across the countryside, it's, it is the land of fire and ice, truly. You look across and there's smoke going up everywhere. It's kind of like, whoa, is this like the last place in the world? There are no trees, where we were at least. And it was like fire and ice. It was a cr strange, interesting place to be. But we had asked this guy, we said, uh, so are, do earthquakes like ever happen here? And he said, would you believe 250 a day? I'm like, what? That didn't even like, I thought he was pulling my leg, but it's true. There is that much seismic activity going on in Iceland that uh, it is that much going on underneath your feet. It's the North American plate and it's the European plate that come together there like major, major plates underneath our feet and there is just a lot of friction, a lot of seismic activity going on there. And in a way, I kind of think of that as Advent 1, where we are today that our foundations are kind of tested a little bit, that we're kind of like, we're supposed to be uneasy about what's, what's happening here. How is God going to do this? What shape is it going to take? How is it going to look? What's happening? Is it going to be shock and danger, or is it going to be a lowly manger? Today, we echo Isaiah's cry, and that cry is, Lord, that you would open up the heavens and come down to us. We echo his cry. Do you ever feel like you want God to just come down here and shake up our earth and say, I want God to just knock some sense into these dumb people? Never, never yourself, but of course other people. Yeah. But no, us too, that God would come and shake it up and shake some sense into us. Do you ever wish that God would just come bursting through like a bib, like riding on a beam of sunlight, just busting through the clouds and coming down and saying, hey, I'm here, no worries, I got this. Or perhaps you identify with Mark's apocalyptic sort of language that we are in an age of political sort of unrest, social unease, Perhaps you adopt the language or worldview of that apocalyptic sort of unease where you want the Son of Man to come and like descending on clouds, the Son of Man to come and rescue us from what is to come with great and mighty power. But God, in his infinite wisdom, his cosmic wisdom, that we do not grasp, 
He came not for an apocalyptic sort of cleansing, and he came not in a way with swords and with fighting and great dominion and power, but God chose in his infinite wisdom to come through, break through into our world, to reveal the power in the powerless, to come to us in a lowly manger on a bed of straw and hay because there was no more room for anyone to stay. So they put him on a bed of hay. He came and he will come in a lowly manger. This is how God becomes one of us. This word made flesh and dwelling among us. Emmanuel, God with us. So, it is not a one-time act, but God continually comes down. God always comes down to us. And the best example of this is by and through his son, Jesus Christ. As we remember Jesus' baptism, the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was there being baptized in the Jordan River. And he looked up to heaven, and what happened? The heavens, they broke open. And a spirit like a dove came and descended upon Jesus. And a voice bellowing from the clouds cried out, You are my son, my beloved. With you I am well pleased. And there, the heavens were open and God came down. And in a similar way, in Jesus' crucifixion, horrible crucifixion on the cross, just then, the temple was torn in two. The clouds came open and it was made known that God was, uh, Jesus was the Son of God. And the centurion said, truly, this man was God's Son. But for us today, Jesus comes down over and over and over again. I'm reminded of this story that is told and that we've read in the new member class. I think I've told this story one time before, but it's, it's, uh, the book is called The L Word, the L Word being Lutheran, and it's written by Kelly Fryer. She tells this story of when she was at seminary. There she was in a theology class, and the professor, it was a guest professor who had been very, very boring to listen to. People are twiddling their thumbs, people are playing with their pencils. He's talking in theological terms that no one understands. And Kelly Fryer is there just sort of shaking her head like, wow, I'm not picking up what he is throwing down. And so, interestingly, the professor picks this up, that people, nobody's listening to what he's saying. And so he goes up to the chalkboard, and angrily, frustratingly, he takes a piece of chalk, and he writes a big, down-facing arrow on the front chalkboard. Right after that, whoops down the chalk, exits the class. Just walks right out without saying a word. And then to quote Kelly Fryer, just so you don't think I'm saying this, he says this, uh, she says this, he thinks we're going to hell. <laughs> the next day, the professor enters the classroom and the message was, God always comes down. God comes down. He comes down to us by the word into our ears. And this produces faith. God comes down. God comes to us through the scripture, through the hearing of the word and receiving of it and living a life of faith. God comes down to us in the water and the word. God comes down to us in the bread and the wine. God comes to us in the fellowship of Christians gathered and sent for his sake. God continually comes down to us in and through the waters of our baptism as we walk with him in faith. God always comes down. This sunk into Kelly Fryer's head and may it sink into yours as well that God comes down to us. This is the message, this advent to us all that as we cry out in our prayer and in our plea, as we echo the cry of Isaiah, God, I wish that you would tear open the heavens and come down to us. 
we have a confident response to that, and that's a promise given to us that God comes down to us and meets us where we are at in our struggle, in our anxieties, in our addictions, wherever we are on our journey. I love that there's a downward-facing arrow on the beautiful crafted ceramic ring around our baptismal bowl. It's a red downward-facing arrow, a continual reminder that God comes down to us and meets us where we are at. God, in his infinite wisdom, came down to be with us in the lowly Christ child, to be with us, Emmanuel, God with us, and forevermore as we now journey this Advent season together. Amen.